Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you would like to jump to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and see the video timeline where you will see the chapter titles and you can jump to a specific section of the video from there. Or you can use the direct links down in the video description. So this week I have four tidbits. I want to talk a little bit more about a sweater that I am reverse engineering and some more ideas I have and some tools I'm using to make decisions. And then I wanna share with you a sweater that I have finished in the past couple, almost finished. I've got some buttons to sew on. I wanna share that with you and talk about that sweater's relationship to the sweater that I'm wearing today. So let's get started. The first tidbit I have today is another death in the knitting community. And this time it's Annie Modisette. She uh, was lived most recently here in Minnesota in the Twin Cities area. She was a well-known knitting designer. She wrote for magazines, she had books, she had many, many patterns out. And she wrote a book called The Knitting Heretic years ago, talking about her unusual knitting style and uh, and encouraging knitters to not let other people tell you what to do. So I'll leave a link down below if you'd like to read more about Annie. So the second tidbit is one that came up in my social media feed in the past week or so about, it's called Textile and Lockdown. And it's about people who work with textiles and how they have been affected by the pandemic. And so these are both people who work in textiles as a hobby, but also who work professionally and whether it has sort of unleashed their creativity or it's really been difficult for them. Because I know, I know from my own experience as well as hearing from other knitters in particular that it has been a mixed bag for a lot of us. So I'm gonna leave a link down below to the podcast if that's something you're interested in. And I believe there's an accompanying ebook um, to this project as well. So the third tidbit is something that a couple of people in my family sent to me. I hadn't seen it. They assumed I'd already seen it, but they knew I'd be interested in. And it was a link to an article that was in the New York Times about the coast Salish knitters and weavers. And the use of a type of dog wool that came from dogs that they had domesticated and used long before the Europeans came and they used, they would basically shear these particular dogs. Um, so I'm assuming these were dogs that didn't shed but had to be sort of sheared in order to get uh, the fur off of them. And so that dog fur was used in combination with goat uh, fiber in order to produce the yarn that they used in their woven textiles. It was when the Europeans came in the, somewhere in the later 19th century, maybe even around the turn of the 20th century, they came with sheep. And so then they adopted using uh, wool from sheep to make their textiles and then those those dogs that they had been part of their native communities for hundreds if not thousands of years just kind of went extinct because they didn't need them anymore. I assume because sheep are much larger and produce more more wool. But I'm going to leave the article down below and then I'm going to leave some links to there was a blog post that I also read about these dogs and then there's a video um, that talks a little bit about this as well. So I'm going to leave those links down below. So this last tidbit is really sort of a housekeeping item regarding YouTube. So I noticed recently that I was watching one of my own videos because somebody was asking about something and I went and looked at my video and I thought, geez, the resolution on this is terrible. What's going on? And I looked at, at the setting, how that video was set and it was set at sort of the minimum resolution that, that you could see that video at, which I think was like 480 something like that. And my videos, at least the ones in the past few years, are all at a much higher resolution. They're at high definition. They're not 4K, but they're 1080p. And you can set the video to that in order to watch it. And what 
used to happen is that once you set the resolution higher, it would just stay that way. That would be how you had your YouTube settings set until you decided to switch it for yourself later. But what YouTube is, is apparently doing is that when you start watching a video, it'll automatically put it at a lower resolution. And this is just to handle streaming traffic, I think, because so many people these days are streaming video that it's just um, a way to do that. So if you're watching one of my videos and it seems like, Jesus, not very good resolution, um, especially if you're trying to see something really up close that I'm doing, you can just set the video, the, the resolution a little bit higher or as high as it will go using the little gear. So if you tap or mouse over the video playback area at the bottom of the uh, video playback area, you, you'll see a little thing that looks like a gear and that's where you can change your settings. So if you click on that, you can change the video res resolution. If it looks fine the way it is, you don't have to change it, but sometimes you might wanna see something a little bit more clearly. Oh, I have one final tidbit, and that is we are into autumn here in the Northern Hemisphere, and I live pretty far north. I live halfway between the equator and the North Pole, and so daylight hours, we lose those faster and faster and faster um, these days. And uh, I, that kind of, it always concerns me as we heading into winter when I, how I'm going to handle the light when I'm recording things face to the camera like this, because the lighting situation that I've had in my office has been kind of a kludge. It's just kind of like we've got a cheap light to do this and another one to do that. And it, it works okay if I have enough daylight coming through the windows. On cloudy days or days like this morning, which I'm gonna show you right now, uh, that creates lighting problems e during the normal daylight hours because it's just so overcast. So I was being concerned about it. So earlier this month, I ordered some lights and a new light, one light, and it came in this week and I'm using it now. And so we'll see how the lighting looks on the video going forward and I can adjust it if we need to. But I wouldn't be able to uh, upgrade equipment or replace equipment, which I've had to do a couple of times this year, um, without people sitting through those, I know they're awful, <laughs> ads before the video uh, runs. And I try to keep that to a minimum. I don't allow mid, what they call mid-roll ads uh, in the middle of the videos. If you ever see a mid-roll ad, please let me know because my, cha my channel settings are supposed to prevent that. So I only have ads before the video starts and then I get people who, lovely, lovely people who send me coffees on Kofi.com to help support the channel as well. And so it's, it's from that revenue that gets generated that allows me to upgrade uh, and replace equipment. So I thank you very much for that. So I want to talk about this sweater again and just some of the ideas that I've been tossing around and some of the, the things that I've been working on. So this is a sweater I've talked about for the past couple of Casual Fridays. It's a, it's a commercially knit sweater that was a gift to me probably 20 years ago. Uh, and I always, I really, it was one of my favorite sweaters. I wore it all the time. Uh, it's cold here in Minnesota and I need, I, I'm always wearing a sweater. Um, from the fall to the spring every day. There's never a day where I'm not wearing a sweater. I really love this sweater. It's, I love the pockets. I love cables and I always thought these were interesting cables. They were, you know, a little unusual. It's not something you see all the time, but it wasn't too, it wasn't super busy in terms of like a bunch of different cable things going on. I got a hole in the left elbow. When I sit at my desk, I'm always leaning on this one elbow. When I'm knitting, I'm always resting that elbow. And so over time, uh, I got a hole in it and people have suggested different ways like, oh, I would have fixed it. And I'm like, I am not interested. I just, it's not interesting to me to, to fix it. Somebody else suggested, oh, well, you could just take the sleeves out, re the sleeves in a different yarn. Um, somebody else wondered, well, would you ever recycle the yarn? Like just rip the whole sweater out and reuse the yarn. Maybe, I mean, it could be done. It could be dyed even another color maybe. Uh, it's not something that I have thought about doing. It doesn't mean I would never do it. Uh, and it's not, it just certainly doesn't mean I think it's a terrible idea. It just isn't something that I'm excited about. 
I'm more excited about figuring out how it was constructed and reconstructing that. That's what's interesting to me. This has been sitting in a drawer in my office for years. I totally forgot about it until I was reorganizing my office a month or so ago. And I realized when I saw it that I could combine my desire to reverse engineer this or recreate this sweater with some yarn that I have in my stash that I bought in order to knit a sweater. It's gray, it's gray yarn. I like gray sweaters in the, uh, in the winter apparently, you can see. But I have a single skein of red yarn that I dyed at a, myself at a retreat and I wanted to incorporate that red yarn into a sweater that had cables and I wanted the cables to be red so maybe there would only be a couple of cables or maybe there would be a lot of cables that were very similar or simple and some of them would be red i wasn't really sure so I, I instantly i realized oh i can combine those two ideas i can use the yarn that i bought in order to make a cable sweater with some of them red with my i with my desire to reverse engineer or recreate this particular sweater so some people had wondered if i had tried uh, drawing my ideas out to see what they would like or what they would look like or if I maybe had you would want to use Photoshop to see if I could colorize different elements to see how it would look. I downloaded a free paint program. I have a Mac laptop so it was like paintbrush or something like that and I experimented with coloring different parts of it to see what it would look like. So my idea originally was that the whole cable would be, would be red and people have had a couple of different suggestions for how I might colorize it. One person said, well, what if you only uh, had the stitches that are crossing over in red? The problem with that, and I'll, I'll show you, I, I've done some colorizing. I'm going to show you three different ideas for the cables. One of them shows what the whole ca a whole cable would look like in red. Another one shows you what happens if you only are colorizing these, th or you're only using these three stitches out of all of them. If only these three that are crossing over were red, you they'd end up over here until you crossed this one and then they gradually move and they gradually move. So that is not something that, I mean, that is something that some people do. That is, I've seen some designs. I think somebody even sent me a link to a hat pattern maybe that's doing something like that. And it's interesting, but it's not what I, I want for this sweater. But another idea that I thought would be interesting would be to have uh, the red, like the outlines of the entire, of this sort of um, oblong area always be red. And that would require a lot of cutting of yarn and rejoining of different colors every time you cross over at this corner. You'd have to drop the red and then join uh, gray and then you'd have to join red over here. It's it's like a complicated set series of ad, rejoining uh, yarns and cutting and, and so I actually decided to swatch for that because that seemed like a really interesting idea to me visually. And I messed up the first swatch because I realized I actually needed three sets of red yarn in order to say cross in the front here, to go up straight here, and then to join another one here. So there's some places where there might be three, uh, three strands of red and so I messed up and so I decided okay I'm going to plan it all out and figure out where I would need to cut yarn where I'd need to join and then how I would work the process and I started in on the swatch and every time I finished a row I put it down and I started looking at email or looking at twitter and I finally realized I kept putting it down because I hated that process so there, you know, there are ways of doing a combination of intarsia and stranded color work in order to create that effect. And it's an effect that I love when I look at like how I colorize the cable. I think that looks so cool, but I can tell that I would never, I would hate doing it so much that it, I wouldn't get any pleasure out of actually knitting the sweater. And that's really important to me. So I, I put that idea to the side as well. One other person had a, had an idea about what if you 
started the red at the ribbing and had to go all the way from the ribbing and then all the way across the cable to, you know, all the way up. And that's, again, an interesting idea. You end up with a, a technical difficulty of switching colors along the edge um, while you're casting on. And so you're working the cast on in Antarsha and, not, and, and, I'm, and I'm not sure that I can come up with a tidy way to make it just look like seamless. It may be possible, but it's, again, it's one of those challenges where like, ugh, but I don't, I don't want to do it. It's like, oh, it doesn't sound fun and exciting. It doesn't sound like a fun challenge. It sounds like a tedious challenge. And so I, I'm looking for fun challenges. This mirroring of the cables that everybody is so adamant about and which I understand that you just have to understand how one decision affects the design everywhere else. And that sometimes you solve one problem and you create another. And so you have to just figure out at what point am I, am I never coming up with a total solution or, or if I do that, how do I want to compromise uh, in my other areas of design? So there's no right and wrong answers. There's only, you know, what is it that's going to please you um, and me? I'm looking at what's going to please me. Oh, I wanted to say one other thing. Somebody was talking about, oh, well, you can mirror the front. And then they said, well, and then on the back, just eliminate the center cable and then move these closer together so that they're more evenly spaced and then you can have two that are going this way and two that are going that way. And the problem that, that creates another design issue, which is this cable is occupying the space on the back that is occupied by the button band on the front. So all of these cables are spaced so that they meet up at the top of the shoulder. So if you move the cables on the back, they're not going to meet the cables on the front. And there really isn't room to move these on the front. Like I said, the, that back cable is occupying the space that's being occupied by the button band on the front. So I want to talk a bit about these two sweaters, the one that I'm wearing and the one that's on the dress form. I wear this sweater a lot in my videos. It's one of my favorites. And every time I wear it, I get compliments on it in the comments and questions about, is there a pattern for it? And the answer is, no, there is not. I originally designed this sweater in 2010. It was, the idea was I wanted to create a master silhouette sweater for myself. Like I wanted to figure out the exact arm depth that I liked and the body length and did I like waist shaping and how much and and how I wanted my set and sleeve caps to be shaped and all of that kind of thing so that I would have kind of a blueprint that I could then use um, with any stitch pattern that I wanted to apply to that shape. So I understood very well at that time how to uh, evaluate gauge, like how to knit a gauge swatch, how to work with different stitches and see those gauges. And I could, I could take that and say, oh, I want this particular shape. I can knit something to that particular shape and get it to work out. I'll know what shaping techniques to use and which ones would be best in, in, and where to place them. I could do all of that perfectly. The, what I was looking to do though, was to figure out what the shape I was knitting to needed to be. So that was what I was trying to perfect. I had a pretty good idea. I had a lot of experience knitting sweaters. So I had a pretty good idea of what those shapes ought to be. And, and then there were some things that I wasn't really certain about how to figure out. And that was uh, for a set and sleeve, like how to figure out uh, how to calculate that shape for a set and sleeve. I had some books, I had some formulas. Some of the formulas were in, very simplistic and some of them were so complicated I couldn't understand why I would need that in order to design a sweater for myself. It would be different if I was trying to design a sweater and then grade it into multiple sizes. Some of the complex formulas maybe would make sense. Uh, and the simplistic formulas were just too simplistic for me. I just didn't think that they would work in all different gauges with all different yarns. So, so there were some, some problems I was trying to solve that, that didn't have anything to do with how do I knit something to a particular shape. It, it was all about how do I determine what the shape should be.
I had seen a sweater that somebody else on Ravelry had knit for themselves without a pattern that was very similar to this. It was just a regular old cardigan and it had these two cables down uh, flanking either side of the front and there was no button at the front. She used like a shawl pin to close it, something like that. And I thought, oh, that would be perfect. That's like, and it, it's not just plain stockinette, so I won't be bored, silly, knitting the sweater. That's perfect. So then I started to run into some issues with that are that have to do with the design, but don't have to do with the shape that I was trying to establish. And that was, I was struggling with, uh, with transitioning from one stitch pattern to another, like going from the the ribbing at the hem and then transitioning into the cables because I wanted to make that transition work. And I didn't I didn't quite have it figured out and I came up with a solution that I wasn't crazy about but I thought was good enough for this particular master blueprint sweater. So I had this light gray yarn. I worked knit the back. That was perfectly easy. It was completely in stockinette. And then I knit the two fronts. And what the first front I thought maybe was a little too small. So I ended up knitting the second front wider just to kind of see what I thought. And that was all in 2010. And then for some reason, I shoved it in a bag and and didn't work on it again. And I would come across it every so often. I think, oh, I really like that sweater. I want uh, to finish it. And it wasn't until 2016 when I pulled out every single unfinished object in my office and then came up with a plan to just work through them all during the course of the year and get as many done as I could, that I took that sweater out and evaluated it. And I realized that there were a couple of problems. Some of them were you know, the discovery that I'd knit two different sizes and so uh, for the front and so that I'd have to rip one of them out and re-knit it. And, but then I also found that this big design flaw at that transition and I realized I wouldn't be happy in 2016 knowing what I knew then of finishing that sweater as it as it was. So I decided to rip out both of the fronts and re-knit them. And another problem, which was that all of the rest of the yarn had been sitting in my stash for that previous six years and I'd used it. <laughs> so I needed to introduce another color in addition to re-knitting the fronts. And so I had to figure out, well, I'm gonna re-knit the fronts in the light gray or you know, how am I gonna do that? So that's how I came up with the idea of using the contrast color uh, for the fronts and for the button bands and then using the yarn from the old fronts to knit the sleeves. And I was able to complete the sweater and I really like it. This is a version of the sweater uh, that I knit for my daughter and I'm just finishing it up. The buttons are not actually sewn on yet and I, I'm gonna have to rip out this button band and re-knit the buttonholes because I originally designed it with five buttonholes in mind and when I put uh, pinned the five buttons onto the sweater my daughter I sent her a picture of it and she's like can you do four because it just seems kind of busy so I moved the buttons around in a different position to make sure that they would be spaced equally and and aesthetically so that I'd have these three columns of two net stitches in between each button and I saw that they would space equally and so it would work. We like the look of it and so that's what I'll be doing this weekend is ripping out the button band and re-knitting it and then sewing on the buttons. When I designed this, I knew a lot more than I knew 10 years ago or even more than I knew four years ago. When I was designing this for my daughter, she had some requirements that made me rethink the method of construction that I had used for mine. Mine, I had knit mine bottom up, flat, in pieces, and seamed it. I don't mind doing any of that. I have to design things so that uh, I can see them from the bottom up when I look at them and I figure out all the elements. If I'm gonna knit top down, I still have to design bottom up and then I have to reverse everything. I just can't spatially figure things out knitting top down because and they won't be seen that way so I, I need to design it the way it's going to be seen. We didn't need to knit hers in two colors so um, so that wasn't an issue. 
Um, there was going to be an issue in length. Like one of the things I knew about my master silhouette was how long I wanted my sweater and how deep I wanted my armholes. And that just came from years of experience of knitting sweaters and knowing that I just like this pretty standard generic looking sweater. I'm not trying to be fashionable. In fact, I don't want to knit a sweater that's fashionable because it will be out of fashion in a couple of years. I am looking to knit sweaters that are pretty classic and that I can wear for 10, 20 uh, years or more. My daughter is younger and she is more looking for things that are at fashionable lengths for her. So she, that was something that she said she wanted her sweater to be a certain length and I was not convinced that the length that I would knit it to, even if I knit exactly what she said, I was not convinced that she would 100% be happy with that length that she might think, oh, you know, I wish, I wish it was this or could you do this, could you do that? I decided that for her, the sweater should be knit top down. Uh, I still wanted to do set in sleeves and there were some little details that I wanted to change at the shoulders that didn't have to be changed. There was just something that I really wanted to do. With my sweater, with cables, you always have more stitches than you would have if you were knitting something that was that same width but in stockinette. So when you're knitting something that has cables on one piece of the fabric and you need to seam it to something that isn't stockinette, you need to adjust the stitch count so that you can match the stitches up. So when I was knitting this sweater, I needed to find a way to decrease up near the seam so that I would end up with the same number of stitches on the front of the sweater that I had on the back of the sweater. I'll paste in a, an up close photo of, of what I did here. And it was fine. I was, I'm completely happy with it. It's completely fine. Uh, the other thing is I do have shaped shoulders here, but one of these fronts is one color and one is a different color. So I really need to have these shoulder seams meet at the top of the shoulders. One of the things that I have been interested in in the past few years has been alternative methods of shaping the shoulders. And I've, I had knit at least one sweater with this where all of the shaping was done on the back. So it's a steeper um, slant and it's all done on the back and that allows you to work the front completely straight. So instead of stopping at the shoulder and then gradually creating um, an angle that angles up toward the neck that way, you knit it straight all the way up to what you need at the neck and that allows this rectangular end to kind of wrap around the top of the shoulder. So you get this cable pattern wrapping around the top of the shoulder and you have that steeper angle on the back and that back is plain stockinette and so you have that kind of attractive uh, angled and you see that a lot in commercial knitwear. That kind of a shoulder wouldn't have worked well with this because of the two colors but it works great with a single color sweater. So there were just several different design decisions that uh, requirements that, that I needed to keep in mind for knitting this for my daughter, like things that were unknown, like for sure how long this is going to need to be, and some little details that I wanted to add on my own. And all of that together combined with knitting this uh, in a top-down um, seamless construction. So it would have simultaneous set and sleeves. So I'm working from the shoulders down and creating all of the shoulder shaping for the sleeve cap at the same time. So all of the stitch, before you get to the underarm, you have all of the stitches, like you have the maximum number of stitches all the way around. I hate long rows like that. I just hate it. But so to me, that's a, re it's a real disadvantage to, to knit top down if I, if, if, bottom up would do just as well. In this case, the advantages of the top down outweighed that disadvantage that I normally see for me in a top down construction. Um, the other thing is because this is the most complex part of the sweater between the underarm and the shoulder. And so that is why I typically like to wait 
until later in the sweater to do that because I like to establish the uh, stitch patterns, make sure that the sweater is the, the width that I want, that I'm getting the gauge that I think that I can confirm 100% what my row gauge is because it doesn't matter what your swatch is, you know, things can be off a little bit, but I know absolutely for sure by the time I get to the underarm, I know what that row gauge is. So if I need to make any kinds of adjustments, I can do that before I get to the underarm. And knowing what that row gauge is, I can um, calculate all of the shaping that I need to do up here. When you're starting from the top down, you have to be pretty sure of your row gauge to begin with. If it turns out that it's different, then you end up having to rip back. So that's to me a disadvantage. I really like working with smaller pieces because I only have to focus on the shaping for that piece. And because it's on the needles and it's maybe 10 inches wide if it's for the front or 20 inches wide if it's for the back, I can see everything and I can mirror the shaping that I need for that particular piece. But when you're knitting the entire, all of the shaping for the, for the, for the neck, for the uh, armholes and the sleeves, everything, when you're doing all of that shaping, those are very long rows. And so what I noticed was that if the shaping changed at the neck, as it did as I got closer and closer to the V, I had been doing spacing my shaping out every four rows at the neck, but as I got closer, it was every two rows. I could remember to do that at the beginning of the row. When I got to the end of the row, I was just reading my knitting and saw, oh, it's you know every four rows, I'm doing the shaping. I skipped a ton of increases on one side of the neck and it, it was too many to try to make up and it's in too visible a location. Um, so I had to rip back quite a significant um, number of rows and it was that many rows of all of the stitches. And it was, that was the one place where I'd made the mistake. I hadn't made any mistakes in the rest of it. And by having to rip back, I introduced the possibility of making more mistakes uh, when I re-knit it. I don't love top-down construction. I will do it, but I don't love it. And so I always weighing the, the pros and cons of different construction methods. But these two sweaters are essentially the same sweater, but they really were constructed in very, very different ways. I'm often saying in my videos that there are always multiple ways of getting to the same endpoint in knitting. And I think that these two sweaters really illustrate that point. They were, they were constructed in very different ways, um, but each of those approaches really served the resulting sweater um, better than the other pro approach would have. In many cases, the construction method really doesn't matter. It's just knitter's choice. For me, I definitely have a preference for how I like to knit my sweaters, but I will give up that preference and choose a method I don't enjoy as much if I think I can get some very specific results uh, that are important to me that I couldn't guarantee with my preferred method. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.